this huge proportion of problems people have as adults with their feet are caused by wearing the wrong shoes in childhood. But the thing that irritated me the most was that the shoe fitter wasn't able to answer my questions. I knew this was important and I couldn't understand why someone who was doing that job couldn't supply with me with the information. I didn't feel they were any more qualified to tell me whether those shoes fit well and they're right for her feet than I was myself. And then I started talking to other parents about their experiences and a lot of people felt the same. So that's kind of where the idea started. When you come to franchising, you've got to be able to put the systems in place and you've got to make it easy. It is called a business in a box. You've got to be able to make it really easy for someone to understand and just unwrap it and, and roll with it. Sam, thank you so much for being here. Pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. When I think about the inspiration behind your business, it's quite an interesting story because it came from what arguably many people might think would be the best place when it comes to starting a business because it was a personal experience. What was quite an innocent trip shopping with your eldest turned into a bit of a nightmare, but it was one where you discovered a gap in the market. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't just one experience. It was a series of experiences where I just got more and more frustrated with taking her to a shoe shop. And, you know, the experience in herself, having to take her there and wait. And, you know, while she just wanted to play and was pulling shoes off the shelf and, you know, I was getting more and more wound up. And then by the time you actually see the shoe fit, you know, she's in no mood to have her feet measured and, and you're feeling pressure because there's other people waiting. And I just found the whole thing a bit stressful. But the thing that irritated me the most and over time I found this more and more, was that the shoe fitter wasn't able to answer my questions. And I knew, you know, from growing up from my parents, you know, instilling in us how important it was to wear the right shoes. I knew this was important and I couldn't understand why someone who was doing that job couldn't supply with me with the information. I didn't feel they were any more qualified to tell me whether those shoes fit well and they're right for her feet than I was myself. And you know, then I started talking to other parents about their experiences and a lot of people felt the same. So that's kind of where the idea started. I decided I wanted to do something about it. Spent six months training as a shoe fitter and you learn a lot more than, you know, beyond shoes, it's all about anatomy and everything. And, and with seven years of experience now, I feel very able to give people that advice that I felt was missing. That's quite interesting. So it, it wasn't just a case of the fact that the process itself was difficult because you're obviously t dealing with your child, but it's the fact that you didn't really feel confident in yes. the person providing the service yes. either. Yeah. And so what goes into learning to become a shoe fitter? So I wouldn't have even thought about the anatomy, so it's good to good to learn a bit about that. Yeah, I mean, it's everything. It's yeah, learning about feet, what problems can occur, what to look out for, you know, how that can affect the whole body. I mean, basically your feet are your foundation. If there's something wrong there, then it generally has a knock-on effect throughout your body. So it's understanding all of that. It's understanding how shoes are made, you know, how different shoes, the components of different shoes can affect how you, you walk and your feet. So yeah, there's an awful lot that, that goes into it. And I don't think that, that most of the people that work in shoe shops now mm -hmm. have scratched the surface of any of that. Interesting. Yeah. So give us some context to sort of what was going on in your life at the time. So what were you doing professionally and personally? So I had handed in my notice at the end of my second maternity leave. So I'd gone back to work after having my first. And I loved my job. I worked in corporate PR in the city. I really enjoyed it. But when I went back after having my first child, just everything had shifted. My priorities had shifted. You know, I just didn't feel like the same fit as it had done before. Um, you know, I felt compromised that I wasn't doing the job to the best of my ability. I wasn't being the mum that I wanted to be. Yeah. And then when it came to thinking about going back after my second, uh, the cost came into it. It was a big consideration. Yeah. You know, I could afford to send one to childminder, but two, it's, you know, it's double the cost. It's, it's huge. And so I kind of think, well, I'm almost working for free here. So yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. is that worth it? And I decided it wasn't for me. Especially if there's time restraints around it as well. And you're feeling like that's taking you away from yeah. the stuff that you enjoy with your family. Absolutely. And that you really raised an interesting point because I, I when I used to, work in the corporate world so I like the that used to be a topic a lot of women were facing it started to economically make sense to be at home rather than working full-time when it came to you noticing that within the shoe fitting industry for children there was this gap in the market there was a service that needed to be a bit more more professionally done how did you go about understanding those pain points for other parents as well and doing your market research I mean it was very much 
talking to other parents, obviously initially my friends, and then, you know, with, with social media now, you can reach so many more. So I kind of just in the local Facebook group, put a survey and, you know, ask people sort of questions. And, and I mean, as I say, I spent six months training as the shoe, fit, as a shoe fitter. And then alongside that, I was doing this research. And I was going to trade shows and I was meeting the manufacturers. Oh, okay. And all along, you know, this idea was just evolving. Initially, my idea was to do these sort of shoe fitting parties almost like you know come along and do the shoe fitting alongside a play date yeah and because I just wanted it to be convenient I wanted to take the service to people I didn't want them to have to you know get in the car and drive and park and wait and all that stuff and it had to be flexible for me as well because obviously I was doing it around my family and at that point my youngest was just starting nursery so she was two and I had four mornings a week in which I could work without her around so you know it's trying to get it into that that time but I found that that didn't work as well as I'd expected because you're putting so much onus on somebody to organize something yeah and I thought I need to take control of this so I started contacting play groups and you know and other forums where people are already there with their children and again it was still taking it to them and that worked much better and from there it's evolved I, I do home visits now so it's just one-to-one um, that works really well for some people particularly if you've got a quite sensitive child and then now people also come and see me at home as well so it's sort of three different ways people can can choose to use the service that's really interesting because it really sounds like you've been able to sort of build your business around the other aspect of your life it's really important to you, your family life talk to you so about some of those initial days when you were trying to manage this new business but also trying to make sure that you were so enjoying other things in your life I've always been clear that I was going to put my children and family first you know that um, I look back now and I know that had I approached things differently I would have grown business quicker but that was never my priority you know my priority was the children and providing a service I thought was valuable to people you know helping people and and really ensuring that you know children's feet stay healthy that you know that was what's important to me and yes obviously you need to make money alongside that. But, you know, growing it quickly and making loads of money was never what I set out to do. So, yes, I've always put the children first, but, you know, there is no perfect balance. You've always got to compromise somewhere. And sometimes, you know, that takes me away from family when maybe I'd rather be there or, you know, I've got to... Friends, you know, sometimes step in and help yeah. out, you know, and take them on a play date for me. And they enjoy that probably <laughs> more than spending time with me. But there is about, and, and sometimes the, the business has, has suffered. You know, quite often I take half terms off because, you know, we like to go away and do stuff as a family. And actually that's probably a time when quite a lot of people would like to use the service. So, yeah, it's, you yeah, know, it's you, true. you can't, you, it, it's never going to be perfect. Yeah. You've just got to make those decisions based on, on what's important. And I think you're right. You've got to set those boundaries and, keep reminding yourself why you started in the first place that's interesting and I, I guess it would be good to know a bit more about the why behind you starting you mentioned about you wanted to provide this service you wanted it to be a pleasurable experience for parents can you tell us a little bit more about that I know now more than I did you know when my daughter was a toddler how important it is to get the right fit for shoes there is this huge proportion of problems people have as adults with their feet are caused by wearing the wrong shoes in childhood so if you can get it right now and I think there is much more awareness we're more aware of our health and well-being mm-hmm. in general now and I think people are probably making you know better choices about their footwear yeah. generally but you know it is so important to get it right when they're young and it's not just when they're really young either it's all the way through the teenage years your feet don't stop fully developing until the end of your teens so making it convenient for people to access that that service so they don't feel that they've just got to go and buy something off the shelf or buy something online you know they have got somewhere that they can go and someone you know someone gives them that confidence as you say that that is the right pair of shoes as a parent that's such a good feeling (laughs) you know it's like worrying that you've not got it right (laughs) there's too many things to worry about yeah Um, if if someone can tell you that's right then you know that's a a huge relief so yeah it's making it easier for people to access the service giving them that confidence yeah that was what it was about nice and you you touched on a little bit about the shoe fitting parties when we talked about this you kind of opened up this whole new world for me 
because I'd never heard about this type of service or event before. So was this something that already existed or did you have to introduce this? No, I mean, this was my concept. When I started to think along this path, how, how can you do, you know, it is a very traditional industry. You have a shoe shop, it might be just for children, it might be for everyone, you know, but that that is the way that, and, and obviously now there's the option of online, but it, it, for me... And why I thought this would work when so much was moving online is I just don't believe you should buy children's shoes online. And I think there's enough people who agree with that. Okay. You, as I say, want that confidence that those shoes fit well. And the number of people who come to me with their children and say, I've got no idea whether these shoes fit. I have no idea whether they're still the same size. I can't feel where their toes are. And most of the children I deal with are under five. So mm-hmm. they are not able to tell you whether the shoes fit. So I looked around and there are a few mobile fitting services for older people, for elderly people, so they can go to care homes and that sort of thing. So again, that's another stage of life where, you know, having the right shoes can be really important. So someone was doing that, but I couldn't find anything similar for children. Um, So I was like, well, how do you do this? And it was very much about community as well, you know, staying in the community, you, you know, being a community service basically yeah. and so I just battered around loads of ideas how you could do that and I th- thought you know you've got to take that service to people to make it easy I mean I remember from way back <laughs> being a child of my mum running Tupperware parties oh. and then more recently you know the sort of Avon and I think Virgin V for a while and, and there were all those sort of things but they were very much aimed at adults I think there was some cooking there you know yeah it'd been all there so so that concept in itself is not new but with the shoes it was definitely something new but as I say it didn't quite work as well as I'd hoped but that was certainly where the the idea started I see I see so would you say that was that where you got your first clients yeah and it it was friends you know so you know my friends would organize for a few more of their friends to to come and you know, the, it, and some of them quite, quite big play dates. As, you know, they were brilliant, and they'd you know have cake and tea and coffee and everything. It was all it was all really nice. It was a little bit chaotic at times, and then you know their friends would then hold one, and it kind of increased. But but I was you know I felt wait I'm waiting for someone to book another one. You know, whereas once I got into the play groups, you know, then it was in my hands as to, you know, organizing those things and turning up and stuff. So, you know, it wasn't what, you know, that was something that was already organized. I'm sure things spread like wildfire when it's word of mouth as well, especially amongst parents and and new parents as well. When it came to some of those challenges, then when you were starting out from going from these shoe pity parties that you you said it didn't work out as well as you hoped to play groups. Can you talk a little bit about that transition? It it was just the fact that you're reliant on someone else to organise something for you. So I had to take that control back. And with playgroups, they're just happening every week, you know, during term time. So they, you know, people were already going there. And obviously I had experience of these things because at that stage, you know, I was going to them with my daughters. And then from there, they're, you know, offering the home visits and and everything just evolved. Was it hard to get in with the play groups? Or did you have to do a bit of cold calling? Not so much because as I say, I was going to play groups anyway. I knew a lot of pe- people that were going to play groups or running play groups. So I was very much connected to that sort of mm-hmm. network at the time. Um, and as yet, I haven't met anyone who doesn't think it's a good idea. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, there were some play groups that just said no because they don't want to be seen to be promoting any yes, kind of business yeah. whereas most of them were just very welcoming and there's in fact there's one play group that I've been going to since the beginning so for seven years and it's recently just stopped and it's just like it almost feels like losing a friend yeah I mean obviously the people that were attending the play group have changed over time but they're all it's always been so lovely and it's a kind of like nice little warm place to go yeah, <laughs> and yeah. you kind of feel like you've lost something a bit especially um, being with you right from the start as well yeah it's like seen yeah. growth so you started your business in 2015 fast forward some years later and you've got covid and global mm-hmm. pandemic yeah. and you started to see a lot of shoe fitting services on the high street close down yeah. so how did this impact your business well obviously it impacted me as well because i couldn't physically 
see people. So shoe fitting is a very hands-on kind of activity. So yeah, I just had to to come up with a new way. So I was getting people to draw around their children's feet, send me all the measurements. The majority of them were children that I already knew. So I kind of knew their feet. I had, you know, the history of, of what you know, how quickly they grew and, you know, what sizes they've been wearing and stuff. But obviously, as you say, there were a lot of people that weren't able to go to the places they would normally have gone for the yeah. shoes. Um, and so, yes, I was being contacted by people and actually people much further afield than I was used to dealing with. With a lot of these services closing down, even like as a business after yeah. COVID, like a lot of high street businesses did, there's the obvious benefit if you're offering a mobile service when things open mm-hmm. up, you've got a larger share of the market. But then also seeing these services shut down, did you ever think that whether there'd be any disadvantages to your business? I mean, for me, there's not because I don't think there's a particularly similar business within the area that I cover. Not everybody in the area is buying from me. So, you know, they go further afield to, Mm -hmm. to get their shoes. But I've felt it and the shoe industry has felt it, the impact of COVID and, you know, rising rates on the on the high street and rents and yeah it has affected an awful lot of businesses and I think it's incredibly sad because as I say I think it's such an important service to have locally there are some absolutely amazing independent children's shoe shops around the country and it's absolutely devastating to see any of those shut because most of them take it really seriously you know where I've had a bad experience it hasn't been in that kind of shop it's been in the sort of more department store kind of where I just don't feel that, that there's the right sort of training in yeah. place and the right sort of commitment from the shoe fitters. But in the local independent shoe shops, I think they provide a fantastic service and, and to, to see that be lost. And it is happening in so many places around the country. And I get inquiries from all over the country saying, you know, is there something similar? Because I just, you know, my local shop is shut and I don't know where to go. Yeah, good few years into your business, probably more so recently, you started to franchise mm-hmm. and I think the story goes something that you were starting to get a lot of people asking you for advice. Take me back to that and tell me about how those early thoughts of franchising came into mind. I couldn't find anyone doing this when I started. Over the sort of years that followed, there were a couple of others that I saw kind of pop up. And uh, then there were quite a few people who got in touch with me saying, oh, you know, I had a similar kind of idea. I've Googled, I've found your business. You know, what advice would you give me? I gave the advice. and But you get to the point where you think, actually, this is happening relatively frequently. Yeah. I'm giving all this free advice. It's taking my time, you know. And while I really want as many people to be able to access a shoe, <laughs> you know, there is an opportunity here. And, you know, do I want to keep this as a lifestyle business, you know, that works for me around my family or, you know, my children getting older now, do I want to make the most of this opportunity and grow the business? And obviously, I decided on the latter. But I had, I mean, I have a business background. I've got a business degree. Um, as I say, I worked in the city and I worked with lots of different types of companies. So I think I've got a pretty good head for business. Um, but I had no idea about franchising and had no idea how to set up a franchise in fact or even if a franchise was the right idea but I knew that I didn't want to employ people right okay I worked with a coach and he helped me put in place or understand what the building blocks were what I needed to do the kind of documentation that I needed and so I'd worked through that process and I was about ready to launch and then we hit COVID Okay. I'd, I'd started kind of putting out a few, you're like, oh, I'm, I'm doing this. I was speaking to Sally, who's my first franchisee, who's based in Devon. I was speaking to her back then, but I said, look, I can't, I can't help you get off the ground now when everything's shut. You know, you can't just suddenly set up the service and expect people to, yeah, kind of, you know, I think August 2021, we signed the um, agreement and then she got up and running in March this year um and then i had another one um who actually was a customer of customer of mine who moved out of london and she set up the second one in salisbury i'm very much at the start of this journey you know i think well with any kind of business you never stop learning um but you know i'm working through a lot of stuff with them to create a really robust infrastructure that can then support you know bigger growth and take it further brilliant how have you personally found franchising? Actually, it's it's been nice to have a new challenge. When I started, I suppose it must be about eight years ago when I started doing the shoe fitting training, it was nice to kind of 
feel I was getting my teeth into something new, learning something new, something completely different that I'd never even considered, you know, doing before. Um, and I really enjoyed that. And then obviously launching and, and growing the business in the early years, that was all lots of learning, lots of adapting. Obviously, I was adapting during COVID as well. And how would it have been another challenge? <laughs> yeah. yeah. But this is, again, you know, learning something new. And I find it really exciting. Obviously, there are challenges. There are days when it feels hard. You know, I've gone from very much being my own boss, making whatever decisions, having no real pressure on me to hit certain deadlines on things. You know, it's, if I if I don't do it, it's only me that I'm kind of letting down. Whereas now I have got... You know, two people reliant on me, you know, very much want that to, to grow yeah. um, and, you know, really want to be effective in helping them grow their businesses and, and as supportive as I can be. So, you know, I have to be organized and it, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying that, you know, something new, a new challenge. I think if I hadn't enjoyed it from that point where I was working with the coach and, and I, I think I probably would have said, you know, let's just let's just keep it as just me and I'll just keep pleasing myself kind of thing. But but no, I, I was ready for this this next stage. Yeah, and it feels so organic. Like your whole journey feels quite organic. Yeah. Like you've had these two experiences, one with a shopping experience, but then two with people asking you for advice. I think a lot of businesses, especially small to media businesses, where the owners are heavily involved in the day-to-day -day management, the idea of taking on franchising, one probably seems quite alien, but also, too, feels like you're almost taking on another business. Talk to me a little bit about that. Was there any personal development there that you had to do? Perhaps less personal development. I was just running the business day to day by myself. You know, I didn't have to report to anyone. I didn't have to explain anything that I was doing. I've never really had a proper business plan. You know, I, I have, you know, pretty much made it up as I, I've gone along and, you know, followed my gut. But having to take everything that was in my head about how the business runs, why you do something one way. You know, I wrote a big handbook that, that people get when they sign up to the franchise. You know, it's like, I can't even remember how many words it is and I'm, I'm still like amending it now. <laughs> yeah. But just that, of getting it all out of my head and onto paper was a fantastic exercise. And I think it was really beneficial for me, in terms of analysing and assessing the business and, you know, why why am I doing something one way? Is there a better way to do yeah. it? Is there a system that I can put in there that will make this more efficient? Because I think when you come to franchising, you've got to be able to put the systems in place and you've got to make it easy. It is called a business in a box. You've got to be able to make it really easy for someone to understand and just unwrap it and, and roll with it. And on that note, do you have any advice for people who are thinking about franchising right now? I would say talk to lots of people. That is always like do your research um, in the early days. Don't, you know, run headlong into something before you're really sure it's right for your business. Check whether it is right for your business. And, you know, I've had someone turn around to me and say, I don't I don't think your business is franchisable. And I know and so, you know, you kind of think, oh, are they right? Are they right? But, you know, you've got to understand why you think it, it's right, why, yeah. why it can work. And then do go to a franchise consultant or a coach or someone who really understands the industry because it would have taken me so much longer to pull those bits together okay. without having that support. So, yeah, decide whether it's right for you in the first instance and then get the support to get it right. Because I think if you don't get it right, at the beginning, as I say, everything's going to evolve in them, but, but get the foundation right. Absolutely, because then otherwise you're going to start experiencing challenges later on and that can then take you away from your immediate business yeah. that you're doing. It sounds a little bit like the coach that you worked with was really beneficial to this process. Yeah. There are a lot of business coaches these days and I think sometimes one challenge is just knowing which is the right one to go for. Yeah. Do you have any advice on that about what to look out for in a business coach? Yeah, I would. I mean, he was very much from the franchise world, which is why... I worked with him, you know, I've since got to know other people within the franchise world and, you know, they all offer something different. I would say meet and really, you know, feel that you've got a connection with someone um, because people work in very different ways. I needed someone who was quite practical, who would set me the actions and I just knew what I needed to do. Whereas I think some people need a lot more help with mindset. So you've just got to find yeah, yeah. that person that is going to, help you on your journey don't just take someone else where you know he helped me but you know 
how did he help you? Everyone's different. So. I think that's such a good point. And there's probably a lot of also knowing yourself, right? Because yeah. if you are, let's say, going for a coach that's going to help you with mindset, then what are those key areas on yourself that you develop in? Or in your case, in franchising, going straight to somebody who works already within that yep. field and knows about it. Something we like to talk about on this podcast is about some of the things that we didn't know before that we do know now. And you've mentioned already a few of them, but is there anything that comes to mind that you really didn't know at the start of your journey that you do know now and it has really helped you? I mean, you learn so much in running a small business when it's only you and only you to, you know, deal with every single issue that, yeah. that comes up and, you know, just manage your time so that you can get it all done. Um, but I think the one thing that perhaps I hadn't, thought about when I started is how important your support network is okay when you're working on your own you know when you're working within a company environment you've got your colleagues around you maybe you know you've kind of got that natural support environment you've got your friends and stuff but but people who really understand the business and I have made a lot of connections within the small business community through so many different forums and you know, some forums work better than others but there are just some people and places that I go back to again and again and again because they're people that understand what I'm going through they're really inspiring you know if you're struggling with a problem they always just sitting down and talking to people who understand the business or your business or small business what well, just getting it out of your head and even if they haven't got the solution they might just help you look at it from a different perspective yeah. and I don't think it's possible to run small business business on your own or with a really small team without that kind of wider support ne network and I don't think I'd appreciate it quite how crucial that was at the outset. Okay and if we look at sort of you in present day with where you are at with your business is there anything that you are working on now or conscious that you want to learn a bit more about with hopes that it was going to help you down the road? I would say there are probably two things. One's very business related and that's to do with the franchise. Obviously, I need to to, to learn more about franchising. I, you know, I'm only a couple of years into this. But, and I think as part of that, as I mentioned earlier, it's systems and structure and probably I'm not as au fait with technology and you know the digital world as I could be in terms of being able to support the you know a wider the group for anybody watching who doesn't know about CC and me where can they find you online so I've got a website which is ccandme.co.uk and from there you can find the the different locations so three of us so far hopefully more in the future I'd really really love it if you know there's there could be a CC and me in all those communities where it isn't easy to to take your children to have their feet fitted I think it just make a huge difference to children's foot health in the future so brilliant thank you so much for coming no it's been a pleasure